Well, the rest of the story. And you and I are going to visit a period of lawlessness in Chicago's history, remarkable even for that raucous, rough-and-tumble town. In fact, Chicago's mayor was facing the toughest decision that a civic leader of his rank can make, although he hardly had a choice. It was either hand over his city to the hooligans or tell his policemen, shoot to kill. And that is what the mayor did. Anyone you catch in the act of arson, he ordered, shoot to kill. Well, the police followed those orders dramatically. There was much shooting, much killing. There was also much arson, more than the newspapers could ever have reported and still have space left for the obituaries. A plague of purposeful fire-starting, incendiarism, as it's called, and a plague such as Chicago had never seen. So, the order sustained, shoot to kill. A young boy was seen setting fire to a building on 32nd Street. He was shot, died instantly. Not far away on the corner of 32nd and State, another fire bug was discovered torching a building. He, too, was shot dead. And then... Then there were two men attempting to torch a Jesuit church on the west side. And they were not shot fleeing. They were stood up against a wall and gunned down, St. Valentine's Day massacre style. Only a handful of instances amid the officially innumerable. And the mayor remained confident that his shoot-to-kill policy was justified inasmuch as an arsonist is a potential murderer. But in spite of that ultimately harsh response, the incendiarism continued for days, and finally Chicago's mayor threw up his hands. Law enforcement officials could not shoot to kill fast enough to stop the firebugs. They would need the support of a national military force. Well, when Illinois' governor learned that the mayor of Chicago had turned his town over to the army, the federal army, he, the governor, was furious. The state could take care of its own problems, the governor says. But nobody wonders, could anything but federal martial law have held Chicago together through that most trying time in the turbulent city's history? You may have been reminded of this retelling of Mayor Daley's Chicago. When the father of the current mayor, what had it been 40 years ago now, when he in the wake of riots ordered shoot to kill any arsonist, Remember? But the mayor you just met was Chicago's mayor 140 years ago. Mayor Mason, who faced that city's most extensive ever outbreak of arson. And what triggered it is most amazing of all. You remember the great Chicago fire of 1871. A blaze so devastating that it left only a handful of structures standing. Well, it was in the immediate aftermath after that conflagration had diminished thousands of acres to smoldering rubble, it was after that that hysterical survivors, men and women, even children, took to the streets of Chicago for days on end, day after day, night after night, madly and explicably setting fire to the few pathetic buildings that remained. And though we cannot imagine why, at least now, history knows the rest of the story. And now for the rest of the rest of the story. It's hard to think of a time when police were given orders to shoot to kill. The Great Chicago Fire, however, must have been almost incomprehensible to its survivors. The fire purportedly began in or near a small barn at about 8.30 p.m. on October 8, 1871, but investigators never conclusively determined the cause of the fire. The most popular story blames the fire on a cow who knocked over a kerosene lantern into a pile of straw. Businesses, homes, some roads, and even the sidewalks were almost exclusively constructed of wood. Strong winds and a severe drought helped the fire to spread with little to slow it down. When the fire was finally extinguished, it had destroyed an area of about four miles long and averaging about three quarters of a mile wide. More than 2,000 acres in the city of Chicago were destroyed. 
Investigators determined that more than 17,500 buildings, 73 miles of roads, 120 miles of sidewalk, and 2,000 lampposts were destroyed. Most importantly, around 300 people were believed to have died as a result of the fire. Now we've all heard of the Great Chicago Fire, but there are three other lesser known fires along the shoreline of Lake Michigan that began on the same day. Manistee, Michigan is located on the eastern shore of Lake Michigan. A little over 3,300 residents lived in Manistee in 1871. A fire which had burned in the woods for several days spread rapidly by strong winds. And remember that drought. Firefighters battled the flames until the wind blew smoke and sand so ferociously that the firefighters had no choice but to retreat. The town was almost completely destroyed. Luckily, no one was killed. About 115 miles south of Manistee is Holland, Michigan. Like the fire that destroyed Manistee, a fire in the woods near Holland spread to town by strong winds. Many of the town's residents remained in their homes, packing their belongings in trunks and putting on layers of clothing so their belongings wouldn't be burned up by the fire. Some of them barely escaped their burning homes before the structures collapsed. Some ladies in layered clothing and carrying trunks made it to a small mound in the town and realized that they were completely surrounded by fire. A brave man named George Howard ran through the flames and helped the ladies escape certain death. In another part of town, a Mr. Joslin rescued several people from a burning building. He kept going back in and searching for more survivors. Mr. Joslin saved many people that day, but was ultimately unable to save himself. Mr. Joslin returned to the building to search for more survivors and never returned. The number of deaths from the Holland fire was low, but each life counts. Peshtigo is a city in the northeastern part of Lake Michigan. On October 8, 1871, a fire in a forest got out of control and spread quickly by strong winds. Sounds similar to the other two. Peshtigo and about a dozen other villages in the vicinity were completely destroyed. When the fire was finally extinguished, approximately one and a half million acres of land was burned. The number of people who perished in the Peshtigo fire ranged from 1,200 to 2,500. Investigators were never able to determine the exact number of deaths, but it remains the deadliest natural fire in American history. The remains or partial remains of over 300 people were buried in a mass grave at the Peshtigo Fire Cemetery. Had you ever heard of the Manistee Fire, the Holland Fire, or the Peshtigo Fire? These fires and the lives they claimed have been overshadowed by the Great Chicago Fire. Well, now you know the rest of the rest of the story. Did you know that you can join my team to get inside information about the stories I research? Look for the link in the description. I'm Brad Dyson, and as Paul Harvey would say, good day.